Thanks, Brad, and uh, good morning, everybody. It's nice to be back in person. I remember the first um, LGMD conference in Chicago now about four years ago, um, and I think what I was tasked with doing is um, to talk about the progress in the field. And so I hope that um, by the end of the two days, your two days here, that you can get a sense for all of the excitement, enthusiasm, and, and tangible progress that's been happening over the past four years. Um, so I'm not gonna cover most of it. Um, that's for every, everybody else to do, um, but um, I will start us off. My disclosures. Okay, so I'd, at first, um, I'd just to make sure that everybody starts from the same place. So limb girdle muscular dystrophy uh, combined, the muscular dystrophies, um, is the estimated prevalence is about one in 20,000. That makes it the fourth most common form of muscular dystrophy. Um, it has a fairly complicated, you know, alphabet soup of naming. Um, and typically, you know, if you are talking about it, and you have a type D or type one, that's an, a dominant form, so that's something that's passed every generation down. And a type R or type two is recessive, which is uh, by far and away the most common. Um, and for these, um, you know, you need two bad copies of the gene um, to um, have the disease. And I'm just giving you some examples there of some of the more common um, subtypes. Many of the uh, limb girdle muscular dystrophies are caused by a loss of function of these sarcolemma proteins. So the way I think about it is if you're you know, building a skyscraper, there's a scaffolding that goes up. And the same thing, when your muscle expands and contracts, um, you know, it's, it relies on those structural proteins um, to keep, it, um, keep the tensile strength and to make sure it doesn't break apart. And so with many of the limb girdle muscular dystrophies, um, you're missing one of those proteins, and so the muscles are a little bit more susceptible um, to breaking apart, and that's what causes the damage. It's not entirely true, but that's, that's quite common. Um, in general, um, these disorders are grouped together because they are slowly progressive um, and symmetric weakness, um, largely involving the hip and the shoulders, um, but you know other muscles uh, can be involved as well. Um, sometimes the heart can be involved, um, sometimes the breathing can be involved, um, and a very, um, you know, and then of course, for some subtypes like dysferlin or LGMDR2, um, there's quite a bit of um, weakness in the um, calves and, and the distal muscles. Um, there are um, at least 28 uh, genetically distinct variants of limb girdle muscular dystrophy. There's probably more out there that we just don't know about yet. Um, I think some of the later speakers are going to be talking about um, finding other subtypes. Um, and like I said, it has a very complicated uh, naming system. Used to be named um, following the two and, you know, one or two and then a letter. Uh, but more recently, you can see in the column, uh, the new naming system. And along with that new naming system, actually, there's a new coding so, um, system for your doctors to put in the diagnosis. And so um, if you look at one of the tables outside, um, you know, there's a little cheat sheet to tell you kind of which codes your doctor should use um, when, they're, um, when you're seeing them. Um, so, you know, and, and other speakers will talk about this um, later on, but the, the course of LGMD is progressive and the severity of, and symptoms and age of onset can vary quite a bit between subtypes. Um, some are fairly mild and some are quite severe. Um, and, um, you know, sometimes when you're thinking about this or thinking that you might have limb girl muscular dystrophy, oftentimes people talk about difficulty going upstairs or getting up from the floor. Um, and your doctor may see you and want to, you know, measure CK, which is a, a measure of uh, muscle breakdown. Um, some of you may have had a muscle biopsy, uh, which shows a particular pattern. Um, but really, um, one key point and, and one substantial change, even in the last four years, is that that genetic testing is really required to identify the cause. Um, that's an important um, take-home point if you are, um, if you haven't seen your neurologist, neuromuscular specialist. Um, in a while, you know, and don't have a genetic test um, to, to provide that diagnosis is really important um, because it's going to have a lot of implications for the treatments that are coming down the road. Uh, and in fact, um, you know, even though that genetic testing is very important, um, it's also really what I would say is a work in progress. And like I said, you're going to hear from speakers later on today and tomorrow about ways that we're trying to solve this problem. But in fact, um, this study here, which has over uh, 4,000 people that had 
you know, suspected limb girdle muscular dystrophy, you can see um, the results of that genetic testing. Um, so, you know, the, most people had um, um, pathogenic variants in calpane 3 or dysferlin, but FKRP and noctamin 5 or short, you know, behind there. But if you really look at it and look at the whole um, um, pie, you can actually see that um, about 72% of people had what's called a variant of unknown significance. Um, and you know that that means maybe it's a you know it's not a it's not a confirmed diagnosis it's not a no, um, and so um, many members of the um, um, uh, the GRASP consortium are actually working on this, and you'll hear about that um, the progress on that as well. So I think you know even though we're saying that the genetic testing is so important, it really is still a work in progress, and we need to do better to kind of take that green pie and make it as small as possible. Okay, so. Moving beyond kind of that um, basic overview, you know, and talking about trial readiness um, and the natural history studies, which um, uh, my two colleagues will cover in more detail um, shortly after me. Um, you know, I think when you start to think about clinical trials and, and testing whether or not um, a drug might help improve the disease, you have to start by asking people living with girdle muscular dystrophy, what's important to you? What do you care about? And that's really kind of the basis of how, um, how we think about it when we think about natural history studies or trial readiness studies. And this is a survey that was um, distributed across a number of different um, LGMD patient registries. And you can see, um, you know, with four being the most Im impactful symptom, difficulties with mobility and ambulations, difficulties um, doing activities of daily living, um, and then hip, thigh, and knee weakness, you know, obviously ranked pretty high in terms of um, very impactful symptoms, but you know it's an important to note. You know, fatigue is right there, um, and um, as an important thing, change body image due to a disease. So I think when we're starting to think about how we design and prepare for these clinical trials, we have to be designing the tools or using tools that capture this impact and to make because if you know you get through the end of it and you, there's a drug that's approved and it doesn't address one of these things on here, that's not going to be very very impactful. So what does, success, you know, what does successful treatment look like? You know, what symptoms do you target? How do you measure change? And is it meaningful? And then most importantly, um, and what I spend my time, Dr. James, Dr. Lowe spend their time doing, you know, do we have the data to prove um, that you know, we're measuring something that's meaningful to you and, um, and it changes? Um, and so that really is the role of, as Brad mentioned, these uh, natural history studies, or as I like to call them, trial readiness studies. Um, you know, they do inform the course of the disease, um, but we don't really do it for fun. Uh, you know, it's not the end game, you know, and I'm sure it's not the end game for all of you who participate in one of these studies um, to kind of uh, watch us, you know, you know, watch us watch you walk or what you know, push and pull on your muscles. You know, the goal of these studies is to prepare for clinical trials. That's the point. Um, and so this, these um, studies are, you know, clinical research studies that are designed to capture the disease course define the population that's best suited for that clinical trial, um, to develop those outcome measures, uh, which I think you'll hear about um, shortly thereafter, or right after this, and um, to develop biomarkers, which is basically, you know, these are the biomarkers are either blood tests or muscle tests or even um, MRI tests um, that help support um, the outcome measures that are being developed, and it's really all of the above. And so the design of the protocols, for those of you who are thinking about participating in natural history studies, really depends on what the actual objective is because, you know, there's a broad range of natural history studies, um, but most of the time the protocol, um, you know, the way the study is designed is actually, um, you know, to support one of those objectives above. Um, so what does success look like uh, for all these studies that are ongoing? You know, do we have the right trial population? Is it a long enough study? Um, do you have a biomarker that gives you an early sign? Um, do you have um, what's called clinical outcome assessments or functional tools that measure symptoms that are important to patients? And then most importantly, you know, even though clinical trial populations are often a lot smaller of a group than the overall um, group of individuals living with that um, particular subtype of limb girdle, you know, can you take the results of that clinical trial and, and export it or, or generalize it to the rest of the population? And this, this graph kind of shows one of the things that I think we struggle with 
um, and um, I have two colleagues here that are much smarter at this than I am. But um, you know, the idea is that for for many limb girdle muscular dystrophies, these are slowly progressive conditions. So we're really looking for something, you know, a, a functional test in that orange line where you can see change um, um, over enough time, um, but not so quickly that you know there's not a chance for a drug to to um, have an effect, and not so slowly um, that the trial is going to last uh, three, four, five years. Okay. And with that, um, um, I'm pleased to introduce um, the um, GRASP LGBT Consortium. This is a consortium of academic medical centers seeking to develop outcome measures and biomarkers for clinical trials, to understand the patient-reported disease impact, improve the journey, and to train the next generation of researchers, and really all geared with speeding therapeutic development in the limb girdle muscular dystrophies. Um, and there are a number of GRASP LGMD investigators um, sitting at that table back there, uh, possibly other places as well. So um, please take a moment to um, introduce yourself and talk to them about the work that they're doing. Uh, many of them will be speaking over the next um, two days here. These are the uh, sites. They are uh, geographically distributed across um, the United States and Europe. Uh, and this is an overview of the current study. So there is a, a longitudinal study in lgmd 2 i or R9. There's an ongoing clinical trial there um, involving a number of different subtypes. Um, there's a study involving Becker muscular dystrophy. Um, and then um, there's a new study that's just starting uh, involving calpain 3 or lgmd R1. Um, and I think, again, you know, Hopefully they'll they'll introduce um, some of these outcome measures, and I, am, I think some of you may be doing some of these tests while you're here, actually. Um, so many of these studies um, seek to validate clinical endpoints like the North Star assessment for limb girl muscular dystrophy. We think this is a this is a good test where you can see um, change uh, over a relatively short period of time. It's reproducible, um, and it does um, separate and you know and capture the symptoms and and um, that many patients experience. Um, this is a picture of muscle MRI, uh, which again, if you're doing a study, you may have one of these. This is um, looking at how much um, muscle is there and how much is replaced by fat. And it's, it's a fairly sensitive way to see change. It's probably more sensitive than um, some of the functional tests, but um, you, know, you need those functional tests to be able to tell you what that change means. So I think these two things really do work hand in hand. Uh, and then last but not least, um, I think in the second session, um, you know, members of the consortium are working on obtaining an accurate um, diagnosis because high numbers of patients have variants of uncertain significance, and that limits the ability both to have a definitive um, diagnosis and will limit access to uh, clinical trials, which is not something we want to have happen. And so uh, Dr. Weil um, is going to be talking about um, some of the work that uh, he and others are doing to help um, resolve or solve some of those variants. Um, and if you haven't heard about uh, this ClenGen uh, creation plan, I believe there's still opportunities for people to participate if they're interested. So please reach out to him um, to see if you have, have an interest or want to get involved. Yes, I have his slide and email right here for you. So, um, but he's going to come and talk at the next session. So this, this really is something, it will, it, it's a pretty um, labor-intensive process. So I think it's important for, um, um, you know, have lots of volunteers and people to help. All right, so you know to close that kind of part of this um, talk, so clinical trial preparedness is a collaboration. It's a collaboration between um, colleagues in uh, the pharmaceutical industry, academics, basic scientists, advocacy, um, and, and you. Now, you know, we can't do this uh, without you, uh, without your partnership, uh, and with a shared goal of moving, um, moving towards clinical trials. And so you know, understanding natural history and how we measure things can help gain um, approval for new drugs to ensure we don't discard a treatment that might be beneficial or approve a drug that won't help. And having this research network really does help build that infrastructure and prepare us um, to get sites ready to participate and, and create a trained group of uh, coordinators and evaluators um, and help in individual investigators or companies take their drugs into trials. But um, as I said, we don't just do it for fun. Um, I, I think actually this was really a banner year uh, for limb girl muscular dystrophy. Hopefully next year will be better and we'll talk about even more uh, progress. Um, but I think um, there are ongoing clinical trials in limb girl muscular dystrophy. Some of those trials use something called gene replacement therapy. 
Um, and so the simplest way of thinking about, you know, the current technology for gene replacement therapy is that this is a, you take a, a virus um, and then you take out the DNA, the viral DNA, and you stick in the gene that's missing. Um, and so this really works best in autosomal recessive conditions. Um, as it stands right now in 2023, this is likely, these are likely one-time therapies. Um, and they do carry a potential risk of immune reaction uh, during the infusion itself and in the, in the short time thereafter. Um, although people are working hard on trying to reduce that um, uh, danger as much as possible. Uh, but that's really kind of thinking about gene replacement therapy as a whole. And there are a number of gene replacement therapy programs in development. I've listed out here uh, based on websites that I was uh, found, um, you know, publicly disclosed programs that you can see here across a number of different LGMD subtypes. And in fact, um, there has been progress this year. So um, uh, both Adamayo and Askbio have announced um, that they have um, dosed individuals with LGMD R9 or 2I, GRP, um, uh, with these um, uh, gene replacement therapies. So that's really uh, very exciting to see these move into the clinic, and hopefully we can take you know some of those boxes from the last slide and put them into this, where we actually see um, clinical trials happening and not just in development. Um, there is a gene therapy trial for LGMD R2 or dysferlin that's been started by Sarepta, and there's a gene therapy trial for LGMD R4 or, or um, uh, beta sarcoglycan also by Sarepta. So, you know, you can see that um, you know we're moving beyond those natural history studies. We're starting to move into clinical trials. As I said, when we come back um, next year or the year after, hopefully this you know this will be a lot longer part of the talk, not the natural history part. Um, one thing that I don't think um, has really uh, been a large part of it to date, um, but there are there has been work in uh, what I call next generation AEV. So these are um, essentially um, engineered. Um, viral capsids that are designed to reduce the toxicity. So as I said, the main main risk with the limb girl or with uh, um, gene therapies is that um, that toxicity or the um, the problems that can happen right when it's being infused. Um, and so um, several different research groups, I'm just showing you an example of one, have actually uh, used um, um, directed evolution of muscle tropic capsids to um, improve uh, the delivery. So the goal of these is to reduce the delivery to liver or other organs that you don't want it to go to and improve the, the delivery to the skeletal muscles. And hopefully the, the end result of that is that you'll lower the overall dose of the, of the gene replacement therapy and avoid some of the toxicity um, associated with it. So this next slide is pretty busy, uh, but um, what you're meant to see there, and you can see kind of in, in column D, um, is that compared to um, kind of, which typically use AEV9, um, you, you can see that there's a lot lower um, um, tissue delivery to the liver and a lot better delivery to a, a number of different muscle groups that have, um, um, that were measured. And so this is something that I think you're gonna see over the next few years as more gene therapy programs come into development is people trying to use these um, next generation AEV vectors to reduce that toxicity um, and, the, and the burden of um, um, the vector, vector genomes per kilogram that's given. And, again, and not shown, um, because it's still too early, um, there are a number of groups that are working on non-viral gene, um, gene delivery. So that's probably, again, another talk um, for the next conference. Outside of the gene replacement therapy, um, there have been uh, small molecule approaches. Um, so these are basically um, this is what you're thinking of when you're thinking about a drug. This is like aspirin or Tylenol. These are, are drugs that you can take typically um, or, um, or sometimes are given by an IV. Um, and these are usually easy to deliver and they, they may act on downstream actions from the loss of the protein. And they have a more traditional trial design typically. So there's an ongoing clinical trial for LGMD R9 or T <clears throat> 2i by MO Bio, which I think you'll hear about later on today. And there's a planned trial by Edgewise Therapeutics. Um, so I think, again, progress happening here um, on, this, on this front as well. And I, I'm a big fan of trying multiple different approaches to see um, which, which works. And I think at the end of the day, we're probably going to be looking at several different approaches um, to, to treat individuals living with them, girl muscular dystrophy. So with that, I can say there's been significant progress in drug development in the last two years. Uh, we do need some patience as these early phase clinical trials begin. 
Um, most of the trials that you hear about or that you're reading about have small numbers of, of patients. And so um, it's hard and it's very frustrating to see it kind of work through that process. But um, it's important as those, as those begin and then you know, move to larger trial populations. In the meantime, we're continuing to develop those tools to conduct clinical trials, and it requires a partnership between individuals, limb girl muscular dystrophy researchers, and pharmaceutical companies, and you. And so with that, I will thank, these are the um, investigators in the consortium, and um, my colleagues, you're gonna hear um, a really great next um, two days worth of information. I just was covering the highlights, um, but um, please take the time to um, enjoy the progress and hope uh, for the future. And, and if you are able to participate in one of the very many studies you're going to, like I said, you're going to hear about or see over the next two days. Thank you, Dr. Johnson. Uh, just wanted to mention uh, a couple things. Uh, first, as he stated, um, all of this um, progress in both natural history study and uh, clinical trials depends on uh, patients participating. So to all the patients here or attending virtually, you're an absolutely critical part of this process. Uh, also, I'll mention that uh, the LGMD magazine, which uh, comes out three times a year, published by the Speak Foundation uh, includes uh, in every issue an article uh, written by uh, one of the GRASP uh, physicians. Uh, you know, so that's, uh, you know, you definitely wanna uh, read that and then you can hear what all of these people that uh, Nick mentioned are talking about. Okay, so we're now um, going to uh, have two presentations on natural history studies. Uh, the first will be given by Meredith James, who's a um, physical therapist um, at the University of Newcastle in the UK. And then that, following that will be uh, Linda Lowe's, who's um, also a th physical therapist at Nationwide Children's Hospital in Columbus. So, Thanks, Brad. So. Good morning and thank you very much for the organisers for the invitation to come and speak at this conference. It's lovely to be back and see some familiar faces and meet a lot of new patients as well. Those are my disclosures. And so over the next 25 minutes or so, I'm going to take you a little bit more in depth about outcome measures and what they are and why they're important, uh, especially to natural history studies and about measuring for management so that we can try and provide as clinicians the most appropriate care for you as you are on your limb girdle journey. And also just to understand the impact of natural history studies on, on clinical trials and also more um, about standards of care. So as Nick explained, outcome measures are lots of things and they're absolutely critical to both the measurement um, and management of disease, but also to inform our pharmaceutical colleagues about what assessments are important to use in clinical trials to try and prove drug efficacy. And so those things are, are things you often do in, when you come and see us in clinics. So if you're seeing physiotherapists, we're a little bit obsessed with movement and strength and and how, um, how your limb girdle condi condition is living, is impacting your, your lived experience, your daily, your daily function, trying to get out of bed, trying to get in, in and out of your bathroom. So we look at um, motor function measures, so measurements of movement. We look at how, um, how the upper limbs are Im impacted. We're interested in utilising um, questionnaires and making sure that the questionnaires that we ask you to complete, all those box ticking that you do about quality of life and, and how things are, things are being managed in, on a daily basis, um, they, those are also outcome measures. Biomarkers, so any of those blood or urine or saliva tests that you may be doing. MRI, looking at your lung function and looking at your cardiac function as well if that's appropriate. So those are all the things that we would count as outcome measures. Now, why do we need to standardise them? Well, you would think as a, a group of international clinicians who are particularly passionate in limb girdle that we would have been all speaking the same language for a long time. But in fact, that wasn't necessarily the case. We were all measuring patients in different ways. And it's really important 
especially given the rarity of your condition, that we actually do speak the same language and use the same assessments, because that allows us to assist in diagnosis. And a lot of you have had quite a long journey towards your diagnosis. And so if we can improve the assessments that we use when we have someone suspected of limb girdle, that could potentially help speed things up. It monitors change as well. So rather than going to clinic and just having your muscle strength measured, actually, if we're using appropriate standardised assessments, then we can help predict what might be coming for you and allow you more time to prepare for what might be next in your journey. It also allows us, as Nick has explained, within drug trials, we need to use outcome measures to understand if the treatment is working or not. We need to be critical about what we use in our assessments. So just because we've done something for a long time doesn't mean it's the right thing. And we've been, uh, as you will hear between Linda and I, very proactive about improving the assessments we have for limb girdle. And of course, as you're aware, the perfect test. Pharmaceutical companies will ask us, so which test should we use in our clinical trial? Now that is not a one test fits all scenario. We need to understand which tests are appropriate for which people, for which disease and at which time. And it is a bit Goldilocks and the three bears here. So some tests are not appropriate. So getting up off the floor, which is something many of you will have been asked to do for a long time, is clearly not appropriate when you can't do that anymore. So that's not a perfect test for all people at all times. I'll talk a little bit about the North Star for limb girdle that we've developed, which is addressing um, and able to assess patients who are both walking and not walking. And some tests that have been used in the past are just far too easy. So there's a test called the nine hole peg test, and that's where you have a, a board with nine holes in it and nine little very slippery pegs, and you get timed, many of you will have done this, get timed about how fast you can put those in and take them out again. And for many people, that test is actually not sensitive enough because you can do that task really easily for a long time. So our natural history studies help us understand about the disease, how it presents and how it changes, and to actually be able to give numbers to how, how fast things are changing so that if we um, implement that assessment in, an out, in a clinical trial, we can understand what would happen without the drug treatment, and then if we include that measurement with the drug treatment, if things are different between the natural history. Now, of course, we'd love, uh, the pharmaceutical companies would love things that were very linear, that things changed at the same rate the whole way through. But we know the reality is it's a spaghetti plot. You have periods of time where things are very, very stable, and then you may have a rapid um, decline in function or lo lose the ability to do something, and then you're stable again. And so what we need to do in the natural history studies is really put numbers towards how those disease, how that disease is impacting you on a daily basis and when those periods of change might occur. And we need to understand, does everyone change at the same rate? Is there different rates of change with your cardiac or your respiratory function versus how you're doing with your arms and your legs? And that's why natural history studies are really, really important. When we're looking as physical therapists at our outcome measures, we are very critical about knowing whether that assessment, and the, the, the ruler is basically the measurement of a, a scale we might be getting you to use, um, whether it's a questionnaire or whether it's um, get us asking you to stand or roll over. We need to make sure that the, the outcome measures, the, sc the scales, fit on that ruler and that also the fit of the scale on the ruler matches everybody that we're measuring. So there's no point having something like just the rise from floor because that becomes redundant very, very quickly. So when we do a scale of movement or a scale of um, quality of life or a patient report outcome measure, we need to make sure that we've got a really good fit between all of our people and all of the items of the scale so that there's something for everybody through the course of the disease. And so you as our patient community are the heart and the experts in your condition. And we as the clinicians are trying to best um, utilise our skills in measuring to make sure that we've got a really perfect fit between the two and that what we're asking you to do in clinic and clinical trials actually reflects the difficulties that you may have in your daily life. And so by using these patient-centred outcome measures, it allows us both as clinicians to try and improve patient care by understanding the diseases better, to create a better crystal ball for what's going to happen next and to be able to give you times for things. If, if you are likely to lose the ability to walk, 
it would be much more helpful if we can give you a few years notice to say actually this test has changed you've got this has got a little bit harder as you've told me and we can see it here and perhaps now you need to think about that getting up the stairs in your very small British house that are very steep is not going to be something you're going to be able to do for in three years time so let's think about housing mobility aids etc as well as the clinical importance, and then as you've heard from Nick, these outcome measures prepare us um, for trial readiness to make sure we've got the right things for the right people at the right time. And so they're, they're embedded together, but uh, critically is that, that you as the patient community are the experts and at the heart of this. It's really complicated though, trying to make outcome measures right. So this is why the natural history studies and these international consortiums are so important if anyone's been to London, you'll know this looks quite like the map of the tube and trying to get round London. And it's not, you don't get to go straight through from one end to the other. You end up in lots of circles. But these circles are really important to make sure that the assessments we use are the right ones for you. So we, of course, start with patient community and we finish with patient care and we take lots of loops many, many, many times going around to make sure that the instruments are robust um, that they're sensitive to change, that they're measuring what they're supposed to. Linda's going to talk through a few of the other natural history studies, but you can see that it's been a very, very busy 20 years. So we're getting more and more natural history studies and more and more international collaborations together to understand our diseases. And if your condition isn't listed in one of these natural history studies, that's where working with your clinicians and making sure that every patient appointment counts with your clinicians and they're using appropriate tools that help us build data. Or, as I'll talk about a little bit, we're also, um, the Nationwide uh, Children's Team are here together with colleagues from uh, St Louis and from Iowa and myself from Newcastle doing some uh, data collection in physical therapy tests here in the conference. And we're here all day till 8 p.m. tonight, and we would be delighted to see everybody down the corridor, on this level, just around past the elevators, to put you through a number of these outcome measures. And that's really important, especially if, you're, if your limb girdle subtype isn't currently in a natural history study. Come see us, because we utilise that data, and then we publish that data to inform the international community about what things might be appropriate. COS, or the Clinical Outcome Study for Dysphalonopathy, has been the, basically it's allowed us to deliver a standard of natural history study that has then informed all the other natural history studies. We were lucky enough to have an incredible patient partner in the Jane Foundation who allowed us and drove this um, project forward. It's now 10 years that we've been doing COS and COS 2. You can see the geographical spread beyond the states and Europe. Also, um, we started in Australia, we were in Japan, and then we um, have uh, progressed that to other sites in COS2. When we started this study 10 years ago, there was no limb girdle specific motor function assessment. We had an adaptation to one that we'd used in Duchenne in Newcastle that we put some trickier things to do, like squatting and uh, getting off the floor through half kneeling and standing on tiptoes, <clears throat> excuse me but we didn't have disease-specific tools. And so the purpose of COS was actually to define dysphalonopathy because we knew there was lots of different names for it around the globe, lots of different phenotypes, and we used a, a variety of outcome measures to do this. We've done that in COS1, and in COS1 we've been able to actually create that limb girdle motor assessment tool, the NSAD, and that is being now utilised in a number of other limb girdle subtypes and utilised within the GRASS study and, and in the pharmaceutical trials. So that's the impact of doing a well-run natural history study is we actually created trial readiness and could inform pharma which would be the most appropriate assessments. COS2 has expanded to some more sites to improve the... Um, improve the diversity of the population we have. We're again validating this assessment and looking at about how fast things change and we're utilising it, as I've said, in a number of, in all the other limb girdle subtypes now too. When we did COS, it was really important that we matched up what patients were telling us was affecting them in daily life with the assessment we were using. And so here, as part of our analysis, we had everybody doing the NSAD, but we also had them doing a patient questionnaire about how difficult things were in daily life, washing your face, having a shower, getting off the toilet, um, hanging up a jacket. And so what we made sure was what, what people told us was difficult was what the scale was measuring. 
And so here we can see um, people who had the least difficulty in performing tasks in daily life are in blue, and they had the highest scores on the NSAD. And then people that were having some more difficulties who were in, in the red bars, they reported more tasks of daily living they had some difficulty with and that was reflected in a lower NSAD score. And then our um, more severe and non-ambulant patients who were in green, again, had a lower score on the active limb, so more difficult or impossible to do some tasks of daily living, and their NSAD also reflected that. And that's really important. It's important for the regulators um, to see that what we ask you to do, all these difficult physical things we ask you to do, actually reflect the difficulties you're having at home. The other amazing part of um, COS, which was really useful, is we use the NSAD and MRI to confirm that these different phenotypes of dysphalonopathy are all the one disease. So some people had a diagnosis of myoshimeopathy and some people had a diagnosis of limb girdle 2B. And in fact, through COS and through the use of this standardised clinical scale that was done by all the sites in COS and our MRI, we could confirm that this is in fact one disease, which is dysphalonopathy. And that's really important because that means that if, when there's a clinical trial in dysphalonopathy, it doesn't matter if your original diagnosis was myoshi or limb girdle 2B, this is the same disease. It's also really important not to forget the upper limb. And again, we did not have any limb girdle specific assessment tools for the upper limb when we began COS 10 years ago. And so we tried a variety of things. And those of you who are COS participants in the room will remember that we had some very uh, difficult tasks like picking up kidney, very slippery kidney beans with a spoon and putting them into a can. Funnily enough, that wasn't really an appropriate outcome assessment for dysphalon, so we didn't use that one. But we tried some other things instead, and, um, and by utilising some, some very nice modern psychometric statistics with that ruler and making sure we look at our patient population at the top of the ruler and the items of the scale below and ensuring we've got a really nice mirroring and match, we can see that an assessment that we developed for Duchenne muscular dystrophy originally, we can actually utilise now within limb girdle muscular dystrophy. And now we're collecting that data across a number of subtypes in all the natural history studies to understand which parts of your arm might be affected um, at what time and does, where, the, where does that cor uh, correspond in your uh, journey as a patient with the other difficulties you have in motor function. And what we can see, this is uh, 10 years of data uh, for the NSAD, so the motor function test where we ask people to roll, sit up, out, st sit to stand, walk, hop, all sorts of things. And over 10 years, um, here we've got also the performance of upper limb. And on the x-axis is the time that people have had symptoms, and on the y-axis is the score, and a higher score is more, is more function. And as you can see, we've captured everybody from the beginning of their disease to people that have had disease for up to 40 years. And what this allows us to see is that, um, and inform the community, is that there is generally, generally slow progression in this disease. And for most people with dysphalonopathy in this case, while they are able to walk, there's not too much involvement of the upper limb, but when, you are, when walking is becoming more difficult, then you may start seeing some involvement at the shoulder. And again, this is important to inform clinicians so that clinicians that are seeing you that aren't part of COS are also aware of how best to manage condition. And this is the sort of information about measuring for management that we want to give the other limb girdle subtypes. One of our difficulties at the moment, though, is our, our data is primarily North America and Europe, um, and some from Australia as well. And we've got a lot of phenotypes from other countries that we still need to understand. Um, and so this is why the patient events are really important because we can capture people from countries that might not be included in clinical trials or natural history studies at the moment. We were really interested in walking and so in COS we also did some gait analysis and we have our gait mat here today in, um, in DC as well and we'd really like to start capturing the difference um, for people who walk um, barefoot versus using um, orthoses. I'm sure you'll find it difficult as a community and I feel a little bit embarrassed as a clinician, but we actually don't have great data on using orthoses in limb girdle muscular dystrophy. It's not a sexy piece of research to fund from funders, but actually as clinicians, it's our bread and butter. And so this gait analysis work is our first work where we've actually had a look at people walking on the gait mat, which gives us a lot of really, um, really, really close detail as to how they walk, how long your steps are, how wide they are. And then we've compared walking with orthoses or walking sticks or canes 
to walking barefoot or with just shoes only. And actually for here, for the first time, we've got a really nice piece of work in Disferlin we, where we can show that the patients who do use a gait aid are able to walk faster with that and, more, and have more stable gait. They have less variability, less challenges to the balance. And so this is important work that'll help us get more um, research into this area that's so, so critical for managing um, ambulation and limb girdle. And so COS and this 10 years has been really important because it's actually allowed us to create appropriate outcome measures for limb girdle muscular dystrophy. We are measuring for management. We don't want you to come to clinic and feel like we're doing all these tests for no reason. The tests we do should actually be the tests that help us and you together come up with an appropriate management plan for what needs to happen. The MRI work has been really important in characterising the involvement of muscles in the disease and allowed us also with the NSAID to, to qualify in, in dysferlin that we have one disease. And we're now working on and about to publish some standards of care for dysferlinopathy. So the natural history studies are really important for informing our knowledge and in improving our management of patients, but also critical information for drug trials. We've now got these outcome measures that are more appropriate but this would not be um, possible without you as a patient community. And I have to say from our patients who participated in the physiotherapy testing in Chicago, that allowed us to validate NSAID um, in other subtypes that weren't being measured anywhere else and publish that data, which was really useful. So our natural history studies also inform our management. But it's a team approach. So when you're being seen in your clinic, remember you need to have a multidisciplinary team. So you've got someone for every part of managing your disease starting with your, um, with your uh, medical colleagues, with, but also physiotherapists, occupational therapists. If your limb girdle subtype has an impact of respiratory function or cardiac function, you need your cardiologist and your respiratory team. And in addition to that, we've had the, our orthopedics and rehab, psychosocial management. But you as the patients are the experts in your condition, and I'm sure for many of you, you will go into clinic knowing far more than your clinicians do about how your disease impacts. And so we're writing standards of care this, the dysferlin ones are coming first, but we're also underway working on other subtypes as well. And even though the dysferlin ones are dysferlin specific, there's many take home messages for all the limb girdle muscular dystrophies from those standards of care. We've created that as a, um, in a collaboration with our patient partners so that we're mixing together the clinicians and the patients to make sure we capture everything that's important. When we did this in dysferlin, we broke up into a few different sub subgroups and we came together in a couple of meetings, primarily over Zoom, as this work was happening uh, a lot during lockdown, um, to create these standards of care, and that was supported by the Jane Foundation. Physical therapy is still a mainstay in the absence of, of disease-modifying treatments that are still in trial. Physical therapy is still the mainstay of management for limb girdle. Um, exercise is important. Keeping joints supple and moving is really important. Orthotics and splinting, mobility aids. Fall management is critical. Having a, if you are starting to fall, you need to make sure that you have a fall management plan at home. And I'm just going to quickly take us through a few of the physiotherapy management things. So your physical therapist or your physiotherapist is, is critical in measuring for management, but also ensuring onward referrals for equipment and aids to give you your best independence in, in what you want to do. We know that movement in your joints can become more difficult over time with your muscle weakness. So finding ways to move and exercise and live um, is a good team approach together, especially things around equipment and transfers. How are you going to get out of bed in the morning? How are you going to get to the toilet? Um, pain management is also really important and chest physiotherapy um, for the limb girdle subtypes that have respiratory involvement. And we need to do this together. Exercise is really important, but it doesn't have to be lifting weights at the gym. In fact, lifting heavy weights at the gym is best to be avoided. But it's exercise or activity, doing something that you enjoy or don't enjoy, like the housework, something that gets you a little bit out of breath, that counts as exercise and activity. We um, try and avoid overdoing it. If you're still sore two days later, you have exercised way too hard. Um, if you get quite dark a year and after you've exercised out at quite a high intensity, you've also probably overdone it a little bit. But it's finding something you like. Exercise is like medication. We're not going to say to everybody, go do some hydrotherapy because access to pools is not always easy. And even if there is a pool, it might be too cold or you might not be able to get in or out of it. So finding something you enjoy that is um, easy and accessible is really important. 
It does not have to be the gym or running, but it just needs to get you a little bit out of breath. Um, these arm or leg pedals are really quite useful because they're portable, they're small, they're not expensive, and you can either use your legs or your arms to do that, and it's a great way to get some cardiovascular exercise. We need to think about bone density, particularly um, if you are a peri or menopausal or postmenopausal woman as well, and you have limb girdle and you've come off your feet. We need to think um, about how to do some weight bearing, and there's lots of different ways of creatively doing this. And um, one of my delightful COS patients has given me um, permission to show how we have combined her sit to stand hoist, her transfer hoist with standing to do two in one. So we use the hoist to get out of the chair, uh, get out of a seated position, but now we also um, use that to do periods of standing to help keep her legs um, from tightening up, but also to do some weight bearing activity. It's been a really um, saves having an extra piece of kit in the house. You've got to get up in the hoist anyway, so you get up and you do some standing. So it's a it's a win-win. We know that ankles particularly, um, sometimes knees can become very stiff and very tight. And so we need to think about positioning during the day and using orthoses or self stretches or assisted stretches to maintain range of movement. We've got a variety of options of that and it depends on where you are and how things are affecting you as to what might be most appropriate. Things like, it's not just the ankles, um, if you have a limb girdle subtype that really affects the muscles on the inside of your legs, it can be really hard to sit comfortably for long distances because your legs splay out. So we do something really simple. We just, um, we're very lucky with our uh, orthotic team that we can make some uh, belts like the lady in the bottom right hand corner of that picture. It's a neoprene belt with a big piece of Velcro so when she's in her scooter, when she's in the car, she can have the legs just gently strapped together. That strap doesn't dig in, which is really important. And that way, with the legs kept in alignment, the feet can be, remain on the foot plates. And also, with your feet in, on the foot plates, your legs aligned, it means your back can be a better, in a better position and, it's, and you can actually achieve a nice sitting position and minimise back pain as well. Thinking about the 24-hour period, if you've got a really busy um, office space or desk space job and you spend all day sitting with your legs bent because you're sitting in a chair, um, you probably don't get the same eight hours to have your legs necessarily out straight having a stretch. So even during your work day, thinking about having regular changes of position, using foot rests, anything to try and minimise that um, secondary complication of, of muscles getting really tight and losing range of motion in joints. Orthotics can be really important. Um, we use a lot of orthoses, um, both for people that are to assist walking, but also when non-ambulant. They can correct or align alignment. We need to be very careful. Less is actually more for limb girdle. So sometimes orthotists who are much more used to you working with patients with cerebral palsy or with stroke will try and give you a plastic AFO to uh, make your gait more normal. And actually, within limb girdle, that doesn't always help. What we want to do is support your compensations. Your body's found the easiest way and the most appropriate way to walk with the pattern of muscle weakness. And so we often start with, with less. And even things with the ankle, even if your calf isn't particularly weak, but you have trouble pulling your leg forward and you've got a bit of a waddling gait, we may go to using an, um, something as simple as an ankle, off-the-shelf ankle splint first before we try anything else. Carbon fibre has also been really useful. Um, and for anyone that is using an orthosis um, and wants to come into the gate lab today, we'd love to see you to do some walking analysis with and without your splints on. We can't forget the arms though, and a lot of you will have involvement of the upper limb, so shoulder bracing and other type garments can be, can be used. And there's more and more off the shelf type things becoming available. Leg swellings are really a big problem for a lot of people, particularly when non-ambulant. And again, this is about your 24-hour positioning. Get your feet up during the day as much as you can, even a footstool under your desk. Look, um, if, you do, if you can't reach your feet when you're bathing, make sure someone is checking your feet, checking underneath your feet, checking um, your hygiene of your feet. I don't want to go racing through mobility. This is a really Difficult topic for a lot of people. It takes a long time to come to terms with needing to use a mobility aid. It should never be seen as a failure or letting the disease get the best of you. This is about maximising independence. So if you are actually having to think about planning a trip to the toilet or how you get out of a chair, 
then it's really important to have that conversation with your team about what kind of mobility aid might be appropriate. And it's not that you, maybe you don't use it everywhere. Maybe you take it on big days out with the family so that you don't use all your energy walking to somewhere, but you have the day with your family um, using a scooter to get the long distances and then walking around there potentially. There's lots of difficult and long conversations to have about what mobility aids might be useful. Bathrooms, critical, absolutely critical to have the right equipment in the right place to manage um, independence. If you have a riser on multiple things, chairs, toilets, um, commode chairs, that can maintain your independence and your transfers for years um, with the right piece of equipment. Also, there's lots of options now for um, toileting when out and about in the community and uh, it is really difficult and I, I know even here looking in the bathrooms those toilets are really low, even the ones with the rails in, it's not easy for people to get up from. There's again also for getting in and out of bed lots and lots of options and talking to your occupational therapist and having a referral there is really critical. Sit to stand, uh, this becomes difficult before walking becomes difficult and so again lots of commercially available devices to make um, things more independent. And for those that are having difficulties with their hands as well, and I was pleased to see the, um, the reusable straws in our, in our gift bags, uh, but there's again lots of options. And as technology gets better and we have smart speakers and smartphones that tell us, um, uh, tell us somebody when we fall over or we can talk to a speaker if you don't have anyone at home with you and you have a fall and you have some sort of smart speaker or you always have your phone on you and you can use voice activated controls for doing things. So that's where that fall management plan is really important. Also thinking about future proofing housing too. But yeah, ensure you have a, ensure you have a conversation with your team about fall management because that is really, really important. Obviously, we've had Limb Girdle Muscular Dystrophy Awareness Day already this year, but we also have, I'll do a little plug, we have a R9 patient meeting in Europe in Amsterdam next year at the end of May when we'd love to see people there. So thank you to the Newcastle uh, and COS teams for all their hard work, and I will pass on to Linda. So uh, just one quick announcement. Uh, uh, you have in the top of your um, badge uh, packet a question form. So if you have any questions for these uh, presenters or the presenters in the next session, uh, we'll be having a breakout uh, after lunch and they'll be taking questions. So uh, just bear that in mind. So if I wanted to shorten my talk, it would be called Shameless Self-Promotion. That QR code will sign you up for a time to come see me in the natural history study. So, or, or that email at the bottom will sign you up to come, come do my natural history study. So I'm from um, Columbus, Ohio. There's, everyone has a beautiful picture of the mountains or the sea. That's Columbus. We're probably more known for the football team at, at Ohio State, the Buckeyes, but... I have some, some disclosures. So my goal today is to convince you why you should come get tested. So everyone asks me, well, why, why should I go? There's no treatment right now. Why should I you come to clinic? It's a pain. I don't like to go there. They tell me I look you know, the same, a little bit worse than I did last time. And why should you participate in a natural history study? And my answer is, Huge decisions are made on very little data pool. So these are, the, these are the amount of people that we've seen in Columbus. So if a potential pharmaceutical company comes and says, so what do you know about um, R10? And I said, well, the three people I've met, and, and I'm going to give advice on three people. So we need to know that we need to get as many people so that we can tell them. And we need to know where you are, because a lot of people, if you don't come to clinic or you don't come to a natural history study, then I can't give them an advice on how many people, if there were a trial, how many people could I, could I recommend? And again, it would be three. So we have the Learn From Every Patient Project at Nationwide, and what we do is we do standardized tests every time you come in. So you'll get the regular, you'll look here to see the doctor, the cardiologist, whoever you need, and we'll give you clinical advice, but we'll also just measure you. So that way when there does come something up, I can say, well, I have 10 people who are walking this fast. 
but it also helps us, as Meredith was alluding to, helping you clinically. So we did a large study on inclusion body myositis, and we found out that they were very worried about when are you going to have difficulty walking? When are you going to have difficulty getting up from a chair? And what we could do, because we had seen 200 individuals, we could tell them your hip strength contributes, but your ankle plantar flexion strength contributes more to your ability to walk. And we, if you can't control that, you can control weight. So everyone, for every two pounds someone was heavier than their ideal weight, their walking time in, in two minutes was lower. So it, it gives you an idea to what, you know, if being thin were easy, we would all do it. But it gives you an uh, idea on why these things are important. Standing up from a chair turns out to be, in this group, is elbow extension. Didn't matter your legs as much as if you had strong elbows, you could continue to get, to get out of the chair. Um, and we talked about how longitudinal longitudinal data helps with planning. So after doing a number of 100 meter walk tests, we know that if it takes you more than 125 seconds, we have to have those conversations. That I know that that means that I'm worried about whether you'll be walking in three years. And as Meredith says, it takes forever to get equipment. If you're in the US, they like to deny it a couple times in the beginning, or they want to give you one that came off the shelf at Walmart. So it takes, if you need it in the next year, I may not be able to get it to you in the next year. And I have this talk with everyone. I've never met anyone who has been unhappy they've had a mobility device. Nobody wants to get a mobility device, and I get that, but I've never had somebody say, I wish I hadn't gotten this thing. I also tell people, you don't have to use it. You, that can be the most expensive coat rack anyone's ever had. And you can just throw your stuff on it. But if you fall and sprain your ankle, you're, you're stuck. So get it, use it as a plant stand, and when you need it, it'll be there. So Meredith talked about how we need something that, that measures the majority of people. I like to look at people on the fringe as well. So something for the newly diagnosed diagnosed people, and something for the people who have had this disease for a long, long time. A lot of times they'll come to a clinical trial and we'll say, well, you have to be showing deficits. Well, I can ask any one of you, by the time you were diagnosed, there was a reason you came. So just because the standard, the traditional test don't measure deficits doesn't mean you don't have them. And so that's why we try all kinds of different activities. Um, and you'll notice that a lot of it is just luck. We, want, we also want to look at how we can get people to have consistent tests. So this is a graph of 12 boys with Duchenne muscular dystrophy between the ages of 7 and 12. And those are their individual times at different visits. And it goes up and down, because what we found is six-minute walk test, especially in children, is more of a, 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 a test of concentration as it is a test of physical endurance. So this is, was one of my favorite studies. So on the first graph, it's where we had, they did a six-minute walk test in clinic. They go back, they do their visit, and I come in afterwards and I say, if you do a second one for me, I'll, I'll, would you do a second one for me? And I, they have an envelope, and one of them says, if you do a second one for me, I'll give you a special prize. Because sometimes we have lousy prizes, and sometimes we have really great prizes, depending on what's been donated. So I'll give you one of the, I'll give you one of the special prizes. The other group, I said, if you do it and go faster, I'll give you $50. And so what you see on the next one, <laughs> yeah. So anyone out there from the pharmaceutical company, I can give you a successful trial. <laughs> That's not true. That's not true because that, the people who were, who were for the special prize were very consistent. They worked hard, they tried hard, and that's the kind of things that we do at a trial. We would never motivate you. But if you look at the, the group that did get the $50, they walked 40 meters more. One person walked 100 meters more. He, he is on my bad list, by the way. He will never get a special prize. <laughs> But that's why we developed the 100 meter, because you can't walk, can't run faster than your fastest. So even if we get the people who got a special prize and the people who got a $50, we're about the same. So there was less, less impact of motivation. So we like the 100 meter, it's shorter. 
It's concrete, easier for children. It's two laps. They don't say, how many more laps? I'm like, well, it's four minutes. Um, but here's my shameless plug. So I went to the schools, and I have 599 normative samples for children between the age of 4 and 14. Getting 599 adults to run two laps around my cones is hard. So we tried to, I thought I was being smart. I advertised in the, in the hospital. I said, come on down. You know who showed up? Marathon runners. Like, <laughs> um, how do I get just normal people, even couch potatoes? So your, your patient, family members, or, or friends do this all the time. It'll take you just, it'll take you however fast you're maybe. 45 seconds to do this for me. So we're back there. You have to run around the cones. We're on the burnham. And Meredith is going to be there tomorrow, so you can just come whiz right in. No names, no nothing. Nobody shames you for, for running. But we would love to have you come and get. We had 19 people yesterday come. The other thing, this is plug. If you notice, as soon as you come off the elevator, that's where our track is. So someone's always standing like this. So when you're coming off that elevator on there, just just give us a minute to make sure you're not going to plow into one of our patients because it's not the easiest. And the other reason we like the hundred meter is because even if you look great and no one would know that you have a condition, running speed is slower than, than age match peers, and that's why we want it. So if you, if the doctor says, well, you're not even showing symptoms, I can show them that you are showing symptoms, and why should we wait till you're having significant difficulties to put you in a trial? So this is for the very top, top individuals. The other thing we wanted to work on, we had a, a study where two boys came, one got in the study and one didn't, son, brothers, because one could walk and one couldn't. So the two brothers came every month because mom had to bring both. So we need something that can span ambulant to non-ambulant, so that whole, whole time. So what we look at is workspace volume. Workspace volume is the amount you can move your arms in space, but also the amount you can lean. And so you get, end up cubic centimeters of volume, and someone's like, well, what does that matter? What it matters is we can predict, again, how easy is it for you to pull a shirt overhead? How easy is it for you to zip up your clothes? Because it takes a certain amount of volume to, you know, to, to shampoo your head. And we can also measure people who have mostly just hand, hand movements. The other thing we like about it is trunk. The trunk um, is, has weakness fairly early on. So we had people with the same arm function but their trunk strength was different. So again, you can, you can measure that. You could use this for people who are walking as well as for people who are not walking. We're also doing some, some work on patient report outcome measures, and I'll apologize right now. We're having, if you come, some of them are really inappropriate. Because they were great outcome measures, but they were developed for on typical abilities. So they, don't, they aren't develop, developed for people with specific patterns of of weakness. So we're doing an analysis. We gave it to 300, again, individuals with Duchenne muscular dystrophy. One of the items is, can you stand on your toes? That's the first sign of, 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 of the disease, is that you can't get your feet flat. So they're getting credit for that, and, and when they should be getting their feet flat. The other one is fastening seatbelt didn't work because people first start of a car seatbelt, then they thought of a, of a you know, this wheelchair seat belt. So there were things that just didn't fit that the, we're trying to make, take out those items and make it more tailored for what, what really matters to you and what is, indicate, what is an indication of how you're doing. I have to plug the Iowa Wellstone Project with, for um, R9. In addition to being a great data collection, it's just a darn great conference. There's mixers, there's education, there's, um, Iowa City is adorable. They play trivia, which I always lose. Um, and they have some travel funds for you to get to Iowa City. So just a, a way to plug, plug that. We can give you more, more information on that. Genathon is still continuing to do a natural history in R9. And, and this is currently in Newcastle, Paris, and Copenhagen. But if you want the contact information for that, you can get it. 
um, the journey natural histories for the sarcoglycans. And this one is closed at the moment. But if you want other information, the GRASP is still open. I didn't put a GRASP slide because I assumed you would, so forgive me. But so why, why is this natural history important? So we had, to, as a control for a test, for the, a clinical trial, we needed to have some kind of control data. So we did the um, beta-sarcoglycan gene therapy trial, and it looked great. So this is what you're seeing. This is the change from baseline on the North Star ambulatory assessment for the limb girdles. And on average, it was 4.6 points higher in two years. And that's great, but it was a small study, and it was an open-label study. So everyone says, well, it was probably placebo. But I had age-matched peers that showed in that same same amount of time, people were down 4.6 points. So now you can say, this is not placebo. This is a nine point change. So it was very, it makes it easier to, to justify if something's just slowing the progression or stopping the progression. I think everyone in the room would say that that is a successful trial, but it's hard to prove because you all change differently, slowly and differently. So these are the individual people's, people in the trial. And some of them up, down, all around. But if you add the natural history again, it shows you that there is a, an even bigger difference and more um, justifiable difference. But to get that, I had 30, 35 people, and I needed to find people that matched the age and the abilities of the people in the trial. So we ended up, we could find five people that matched it. So that was the control group. And you, you know you're all different and some people are, are way different. So if I get someone who's way different in the control group, then you know, it doesn't average out with these small numbers. So the easiest way to follow how to find out about a clinical trial is, well, I had my email up there, NMD trial info, shameless plug. Um, you can also go on clinicaltrials.gov and you put in limb girdle, and these are what come out right now for limb girdle natural history. And then this is when I clicked on the one for the GRASP. It tells you who's eligible. It tells you who to contact, where all the sites are. So it just it's everything in one place. So if you want to just go through clinicaltrials.gov every once in a while, I'll keep you up to date. The other thing we've been working on and with natural history is we're trying to see if we can do these things remotely. So we're doing a study where we see you in the clinic and then we see you in your home via live stream. And so we, what we found is for um, the, the Duchenne-based North Star assessment, we got, it was almost the same. So we were very pleased that we could do this from your home, which will help if you can't travel or you have a job or a family or all kinds of obligations and it's not easy for you to come to vacation in sunny Columbus, Ohio. The other thing we're working on is activity monitoring. Um, we gave someone, we gave people Fitbits. And not a huge surprise to you all, people with limb girdle walk less steps than, than healthy people. But it's a way to show the difference and it's a way to show change. If the treatment is making you walk more steps, it's an easy way and we can monitor you, monitor you at home. Once again, we're right around the corner. Um, you can, you can do the, use the QR code to make an appointment. You can come stop by and see me. And I really encourage you, there's, we have activities for people who are, are just newly diagnosed, and we have activities for people who, who are, had the disease for a really long time, and we have patient report outcome measures. And you can do as much or as little as you want. Or you can just come and tell us who you are, and then I will have that information. So if someone says, hey, I hear there's a new trial coming, I go through my spreadsheet and I say, oh, it's going to enroll people who can get from sit to stand with R12. Then I can pull all those, and I send you a no obligation email that says, here's what, I, here's what is happening. If you want more information, then you go, I'll give you the contact information. So thank you very much. Um, we have seven of us here to do some to do some testing. <laughs>